Right now on KIDK Eyewitness News 3, the prospect of a new subdivision has one neighborhood riled up. We will tell you why this change could have a big impact. Plus, a traumatic situation ends with one family looking for a new place to live. To see what happened to one little boy that has his mother so upset. And a young student makes history at CEI, not only for what she's done at that campus, but at another campus as well. KIDK Eyewitness News 3 begins right now. This is KIDK Eyewitness News 3. Plans for a new subdivision have uh, neighbors not in favor. Good evening, I'm Todd Coons. Thanks for being here with us tonight. That is our top story. People living in the neighborhood raise concerns at the Idaho Falls planning and zoning meeting tonight. The new development called Manchester Estates has 53 buildable lots and four common lots. It will be located along Stonebrook Lane and Castle Rock Lane near Taylor View Middle School. Now one complaint about the new development says it will add to the already overcrowding problem at Sunnyside Elementary School and Taylor View Middle School. Neighbors are also concerned about the traffic flow in and out of that neighborhood. There is also concern over how the developer acquired the property. It originally belonged to Idaho Falls School District 91. However, the developer, Rockwell Homes, and the school district did a land swap. Rockwell Homes received the proposed development land and the school district received a piece of land from Rockwell Homes. We will post on our website, KIDK.com, as soon as we get that decision and it is handed out. Uh, that again, KIDK.com is the website. Uh, tonight's recommendation will go to the Idaho Falls City Council for a vote. We do have some breaking news tonight. Just came into the newsroom. A tricycle designed to help a 14-year-old girl with special needs stay active is back where it belongs. Avery Price was at a friend's house last Wednesday when it was taken from the front lawn. And since that time, Pocatello Police and even the community have searched for it. And we have just received word from a viewer on Facebook and we have confirmed the information that she found the tricycle and reported it to police. And tonight, Avery's grandmother confirms all of this with us. It is back with the family. Still got some snow falling right now on Teton Pass. The leftovers from the showers that came through earlier today still hitting up there in far eastern Idaho and western Wyoming along the border. Uh, we are seeing a little bit of the stick to the roadway here, but traffic is moving uh, just a little slower tonight over the pass with some of that slush. But uh, really that snow is confined to the very top of the Teton Pass around the rest of the region right now. Clearing out beautiful sunset over Idaho Falls tonight. Uh, a few just lingering dark clouds out there, but nothing major. And over on Viper Radar, there is that little bit of rain snow out towards uh, far eastern Idaho and western Wyoming over Teton Pass like I just showed you. A few spotty showers coming across central Idaho tonight and more through Twin Falls. But generally we're going to start drying things out and we're going to add in some more wind to the forecast. This is the wind cast here for tonight and tomorrow. Look for some gusty conditions outside with your sustained wind speeds into the teens and 20s tomorrow with occasional gusts getting up to 30 miles an hour. So we're adding more wind into the mix here. Temperatures tonight into the upper 30s to low 40s. When I return, we're going to talk more about warming temperatures in your eight day outlook. Todd. All right, Michael, thanks. A husky dog attacks a young boy in Idaho Falls. Six year old Ivan Machen was playing in the backyard of his duplex home this past Sunday. It is shared with the neighbors. That is when his neighbor's emotional support animal started biting him on the head. Ivan's mother ran from inside their house to find her young son covered in blood. He was then taken to the hospital and needed 11 staples in his head. Animal Control has quarantined the Husky while they are investigating. He said, the dog bit me. And I just, I was looking at the dog right there at the bottom of the stairs. He was still trying to come in and get my son. Why don't you feel safe anymore? Because of the dog and stuff that happened that I went through. This traumatic experience has left uh, Tina and Ivan feeling so unsafe they plan to be moving sometime next week. In your crime news tonight, a man found sleeping inside a business yesterday is now in the Bonneville County Jail. Deputies were called to the 3400 block of the 15th East in Idaho Falls, and there they found the 33-year-old Idaho Falls man in a room trying to hide drug paraphernalia. Jonathan P. Buchanan was found with a significant amount of cash, approximately a half a gram of methamphetamine and one gram of heroin. Further investigation determined that cash belonged to the business and about $600 worth was reported missing. 
Uh, Buchanan was arrested on charges of felony possession of heroin, felony possession of methamphetamine, and misdemeanor charges of petty theft and possession of drug paraphernalia. Two people in Idaho Falls are facing drug charges, traffic, uh, drug trafficking charges, and theft charges. Bonneville County Sheriff's deputies went to the Target parking lot on South 25th East in Ammon in relation to a retail theft Sunday around 7.30 in the evening. Deputies stopped 37-year-old Haven M. Torres and 40-year-old Camille J. Gamino of Idaho Falls. Torres was caught with new women's underwear with price tags still on the items. He told deputies he found them on the ground. A canine then indicated drugs were inside the car. A search turned up several items of drug paraphernalia and about one and a half ounces of meth. More items of stolen clothing were also found. Torres and Gamino were booked into the Bonneville County Jail. Some road construction started today on the southbound off-ramp of I-15 at exit 47, which is Merrill Road in McCammon. ITD had to close the exit for a few hours today while they started laying down some asphalt. That exit will remain closed while the asphalt settles. Drivers should use exit 44, which is Jensen Road, and follow the detour signs during construction. The Rose Road construction begins a new phase today. Idaho Transportation Department crews are now removing asphalt and beginning to move some dirt for the interchange. The work will continue through Friday. You need to expect some redirecting of the traffic lanes. The entire project should be complete late this year. In your education news now tonight, Shelley 8th graders have a story to tell after a field trip takes a twist. Two buses full of students got stuck in the mud on a field trip to the Fremont County Civil Defense Caves this afternoon. Deputies went to Red Road, that's near St. Anthony, at about 1215. They ended up using sand dune Humvees to pull the buses out shortly before 3 this afternoon. Both buses then headed back to Shelley. Elementary students around Bannock County are learning about the importance of clean water. Today they gathered at the Pocatello Water Department for National Drinking Water Week. The Wastewater Treatment Department treats millions of gallons of sewage every day, a process that's not easy. The importance of knowing what you're putting down your drains, that what you're putting down your drains, mm -hmm. someone somewhere has to take care of what you put down your drains, whether that's mm -hmm. a flushable wipe that's really not flushable, whether that's chemicals that you want to just dump down your drain. All of that needs to be taken care of by somebody before we put it back into the river. The department tells us on average 7 million gallons of treated water is put back into the Portneuf River every single day. A commencement for the College of Eastern Idaho is planned for this Thursday night. 485 degrees will be awarded. Commencement exercises will begin at 7 at the Idaho Falls Civic Center for the Performing Arts. And one of the graduates from the College of Eastern Idaho stands out a little bit for her achievement. KIDK Eyewitness News 3 reporter Ariel Schroeder introduces us to the first student to ever graduate from CEI while also graduating from high school. Meet Lindsay Gardells. If you think she's an average high schooler, well, that's because she is, but she also isn't. How many high schoolers can you say are graduating from college before high school? Well, Lindsay can. Uh, this one's for my high school graduation, and this one is for the college graduation. It feels pretty great because it's something that no one else has done, and it just makes me feel like I can do anything, kind of. Lindsay will be graduating from CEI this week and will graduate from Skyline at the end of May, and this wasn't intentional. It was definitely a happy coincidence. I had never heard of it before, and my aunt told me about it, and I was like, well, let's try it. Yeah. See if it can be done. Well, she did it and her parents and teachers couldn't be more proud. Lindsay is my very first that is actually graduating. I've had plenty of students that have done both, you know, classes here at high school and at college, but she's the first to actually complete both. I'm just super proud of her and I look forward to all she accomplishes in the future. It's been, it's been pretty amazing, to be honest, uh, to see her grow and develop differently than maybe some of the other kids do. It's, it's, been, it's been pretty wonderful seeing her grow. Lindsay had to miss out on a lot of high school experiences to prep for her graduation, but says it was all worth it. I didn't go to prom this year, but it was worth it to me because I get to walk this week for college and I may have not been around the people who I would have gone with, but I met so many other great people. Reporting in Idaho Falls, I'm Ariel Schroeder. Lindsay will start next semester at BYU-Idaho where she will study accounting. A self-automated piece of technology is taking the stress out of dairy farming. 
Find out how this robot is yielding greater success. That's next on KIDK Eyewitness News 3. KIDK Eyewitness News 3 continues. There have been a number of sci-fi movies where robots take over the world. That hasn't happened, but robots are taking over parts of an Idaho dairy industry. Jay Hildebrand takes us to one such dairy farm and tells us why this technology is so impressive. Nestled in the hills of Franklin, Idaho is the Hobbs Dairy Circle 7 Ranch. So how many cows do you have in this barn? In this barn we have 360, there's 180 on each side. Troy Hobbs is a third generation dairy farmer. His grandfather started this dairy in 1927 with eight cows and passed the operation on to his son, who passed it on to Troy. Hobbs has seen a lot of technological advancements in the industry since he was a kid on this farm. Last year, he invested in the most advanced technology yet, robots. It was amazing to watch the cows all on their own walk over to the robot whenever they wanted to be milked. Each cow has a red tag the robot reads to identify the cow. Hobbs explains how the robots work. Yeah, she'll want to go in a robot for two reasons. Number one, to eat the grain. We feed her according to how much milk. And also because of the pressure of her udder, she'll want to release that. It's, it's painful when it gets really tight. It's going to have a brush that comes in and it'll, it'll uh, clean her udder. It has a disinfectant that'll clean it really good. Then it'll go back out, it'll wash it off and then it'll come back and dry it and dry the udder off. You should see a red laser and it'll actually find the teats and then, and then that's how it locates them. All the milk goes into here and it's on a scale and so it'll weigh the milk each time it, the cow milks. So this screen is just a quick glance. The top line here is this cow's milking almost 28 pounds of milk as a total. So now it opens the gate, it's gonna push her out. And then the next cow is right ready. She's, you know, waiting to get in there. In a robot barn, the whole time, the time the cow walks in and the, and the time she walks out is six minutes. In our conventional barn, it takes us 15 minutes. There are other robotic elements to the dairy. This robot called the Juno kind of looks a little like R2-D2. As the cows eat, they like to burrow, see the holes in the feed, and they kind of push it out, you know, with their nose. It kind of comes out like this. Then they can't get to it, huh? Yeah, and then they can't reach it because of the, the way the mangers are. And so now, you'll see this feed I kicked out, you'll see it, it'll push it closer. And so every time it runs, it goes one inch closer. It does this once an hour. They only have to put the feed down once a day. Then there's this brush that the cows can activate just by pushing on it. They love getting their heads and back scratched. Hobbs wants to make sure the cows are comfortable while laying down too. There's, we call it a, a poly pillow on there that kind of positions her where to lay. The biggest advantage of a robotic barn is that these cows are a lot happier. A happy cow makes more milk. The vet was just here on Tuesday and he said, Troy, I was really skeptical when you put the robots in. And now he looked at him on Tuesday and he said the robot cows are more content, they're healthier, they're, they're just a lot better. He can see the difference of a robot cow opposed to the conventional uh, barn. So all this is designed to ease the stress on the cows. The environment in a robot barn is, is much more relaxed, uh, stress-free. We don't yell at the cows anymore. <laughs> we say, come on, get out, come on, get up. And now we don't, we don't say anything. If she's thirsty, they'll get a drink. If she wants to eat, she'll come and eat. If she's ready to milk, she'll go ahead and walk to the robot. So she makes her own decisions um, instead of us as humans telling her what to do. And the results of that stress-free life for the cows in a robot barn compared to a conventional barn? We're finding that we're gaining about 20% more milk. Our best cow right now on the herd is milking 160 pounds of milk a day. And she's going in the robot uh, five times a day. The robot barn saves on manpower costs too. We have one guy running 360 cows. And um, in my conventional barn right now, we're currently milking 200 cows and we have, uh, it's a three-man operation. Robots are an exciting innovation, but the cost comes at a time when dairy farmers aren't even breaking even. Add that to trade imbalances and competition for milk substitutes, it's a stressful time. But the benefits of being a dairy farmer make it worth it for Troy Hobbs. The benefits or the things that make me happy is I can see the results of my own work. I get the joys of my own work and then I love chocolate milk, I love cheeseburgers, I love, I love beef and, and dairy products. So it's, it's fun to, to be able to produce my own dairy products.
So the family tradition lives on with the help of robots at the Hobbs Dairy Circle 7 Ranch. Cows are a creature of habit and get used to being milked at a certain time of day. And Troy tells us for about a week, 30 workers had to push about 360 cows over to the robot. That is until they finally figured out the new routine. Pretty happy cows there. Uh, we're bringing in some showers tonight. Just a few leftovers from the storms from earlier. Coming up next, we're going to talk more about some turbulent conditions with the winds tomorrow and Thursday and things really starting to heat up in that eight day forecast. Check out your highs and lows from around the region back in a minute with a full check through with the forecast. alert forecast with meteorologist Michael Coates. Well, I take you to the top of Teton Pass. It's still snowing lightly up there. You can't really see it on this view, but we're still getting a bit of some light rain and snow in far eastern Idaho and western Wyoming tonight. And there has been also just a couple of rumbles of thunder there near the Palisades just about an hour ago, but things are starting to dry up as we push forward on the Viper laps. And you can also see that there's still a few pockets of a few light rain showers in central Idaho and then also through Twin Falls in the Minicasha area. Area of low pressure to our south. That's going to spin up more or wet weather across Utah and Colorado, and we're just on the edge of this. And we're going to bring in a, just a couple of thunderstorms in here for your Wednesday and Thursday, but we're definitely increasing the wind. We have a system coming in from the north, meeting up with its big brother down here to the south, and we're going to see some gusty conditions with our winds tomorrow and Thursday. So yeah, we're subtracting some showers, but we're going to be adding in some windy conditions. In that Viper cast tonight, those showers and thunderstorms drying up, it should be a fairly quiet, sunny Wednesday. Wednesday morning with the sun out in the morning and midday, a few clouds and thunderstorms out for the afternoon hours. And again, most of the thunderstorms uh, favoring the higher elevations, of course. I'll get a few thunderstorms spurting across the Snake River Plain and the lower Snake River Plain out towards the Magic Valley there. But you'll notice that the shower risk is much thinner tomorrow. I'm not expected to see anything heavy or severe. You could get some good snow and rain showers in extreme southeastern Idaho and southwestern Wyoming, but for the most part, uh, we're just dealing with the run of the mill springtime isolated thunderstorm threat for the next couple of days. Then high pressure will build back in and we're looking at warmer temperatures for Mother's Day weekend. So for tonight and tomorrow, we still got a few pockets of showers out there. So we'll call it scattered showers here for tonight and tomorrow. The winds on the move. We'll start seeing more wind out of the northeast at 15 to 35. That's your wind gust range there, 35 to 40. We don't have a wind advisory for the valley, just a wind advisory for the reservoir on American Falls. And then a sunny, warm weekend kicks in, and we're looking at really warm conditions in that eight-day forecast. Highs at 55 for Montpelier, 59 in Preston, 61 in McCammon with 54 Soda Springs. Check out Rexburg, high of 58. Lows there back into the mid-30s, lower 30s in Jackson with a high of 52. Upper 40s in West Yellowstone, Montana with 53 in Stanley and 64 in Chalice. And check out the Snake River Plain. I got Idaho Falls coming at 62 tomorrow, 65 in Pocatello in the mid-60s. Also for Burley with the lower 60s up through Rigby and the INL. Here's your eight-day forecast and look ahead here to some really warm conditions coming in for Sunday and Monday as we head into next week. So Mother's Day, sunny, hot, highs around 75 to 80 degrees and that's going to continue through Monday with the warm weather and then we're dropping temperatures a little bit with a few thunderstorms late in the eight day forecast. Now for the next couple of days and not the best conditions outside granted upper 50s lower 60s just a smidge cooler on Thursday with more thunderstorms for the afternoon and some gusty winds. Pocatello high of 65 for tomorrow 60 on Thursday and the lower 70s on Saturday close to 80 degrees for Mother's Day with plenty of sunshine. As we go to Rexburg and Blackfoot, Blackfoot, you got a high here of 63 for tomorrow and 59 on Thursday with the lower 70s on Saturday and the upper 70s on Sunday. Rexburg, 
and chilly tonight. Lows back in the 30s and we'll see conditions staying cool with numbers only into the mid 50s on Thursday. Gusty winds with the winds back off for the weekend. Warm weather coming through on Saturday with a high of 68 then 75 on Sunday. Over to central Idaho for salmon. Chalice Stanley got you in the mid 60s tomorrow. A few passing thunderstorms for your Wednesday. Drier on Thursday and Friday with highs hitting 80 degrees for the valleys of around salmon and chalice for Saturday afternoon. And we'll continue that for Mother's Day. Over to Jackson Hole and the surrounding region here. Highs will be in the low 50s, upper 40s. Pretty cool and windy here for your Wednesday and Thursday. But even in Jackson, Yellowstone Island Park looking great this weekend with highs pushing close to 70 by Sunday. Our Tad Jenkins Spirit of Idaho takes us to Market Lake. Uh, Kathleen from the Annis area took this picture. And uh, Mother Goose there with her uh, little babies just swimming behind her. And that could be Daddy Goose right there. I don't know. <laughs> kind of hard to tell sometimes, but uh, definitely Spirit of Idaho, especially this time of year. You can see also um, a lot of the Mama Goose uh, walking around there, uh, Mama Geese uh, walking around uh, the Greenbelt, Idaho Falls. In fact, just saw some the other day. Go to kdk.com, log on to the weather tab there, and you can see the Spirit of Idaho gallery and also upload photos for yourself to win some fabulous prizes. But Todd, warm, warm, warm for this weekend. I mean, we haven't seen this in a long time. Like it, like it, like it. That's a good photo to take a gander at. Okay, we'll be right okay. back. Here we go. KIDK Eyewitness News 3 continues. Turning now to your consumer news, the Idaho Falls Community Food Bank is setting up a fundraising event to buy its current warehouse as a permanent storage facility. The event will begin in August. It is called the Community Food Basket Hunger Games. The fundraiser invites teams to compete in a series of challenges that will go all the way until the winter of 2020. A new study shows Floor Idaho at the Idaho National Laboratory generated $800 million for Idaho's economy last year. The Idaho Cleanup Project employed just more than 1,600 employees in 2018 with an average annual salary of $90,000. Floor Idaho employees put about $250 million back into local businesses through the purchase of goods and services. The study also finds the company provided $814 million in benefits to the state. But last month, Floor Idaho announced it will reduce its workforce by 190 people this fiscal year. Idaho's tax revenue is coming in a little higher than expected for April, but it is still falling short for the fiscal year. The Legislative Services Budget and Policy Office says collections came in about $36 million higher for April. However, if May and June come in as they are expected, the state will have about 1% less in revenue than it collected last year. Wyoming visitors spent more than $3.8 billion last year, which is nearly a 7% increase. The report released yesterday by the Wyoming Office of Tourism shows a steady rise in traveler spending since 2007. The leisure and hospitality industry supports this claim as it's now the largest private sector employer in the state of Wyoming, supporting more than 32,000 jobs. Around the region now, a planned hiking and biking trail connecting Redfish Lake and Stanley is being challenged in federal court. The owners of the Sawtooth Mountain Ranch are filing the lawsuit. They are seeking to stop the U.S. Forest Service from building a 4.4-mile trail for pedestrians, cyclists, and horseback riders. That trail would cut right across the Sawtooth Mountain Ranch. But the Sawtooth National Forest has a conservation easement deed dating to 2005. It says allows the trail to cross the private property. Idaho Governor Brad Little announces block grant awards. Bear Lake and Custer counties have been awarded two of 15 community development block grants. A $150,000 grant will be earmarked to help upgrade the Senior Community Center in Montpelier. Custer County received $500,000 in support of the North Custer County Rural Fire District Station. The grant program is funded with money received each year from the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development. We will be right back. KIDK Eyewitness News 3 continues. U.S. Forest Service National Helicopter Repel Program will drop in on the Salmon Chalice National Forest this spring for comprehensive training. This training will help with hard to rescue or hard to reach fire situations and all other hazard operations. 95 veteran repellers will be in Salmon May 13th through the 18th to do this. This is training at the Salmon Air Base in Haynes Creek. Four helicopters will be used in the training. Gosh. Mm-hmm. Just gonna 
slide down this rope yes. out of a helicopter. No big deal. No big deal. Yeah. I can say I have repelled, but not out of a helicopter like that. I have done the fake climbing wall and repelled <laughs> down. That counts. But does that count? We'll say it counts. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Our weather. Got a little thunderstorm activity tonight. Uh, just a few isolated storms tonight and tomorrow afternoon. But the big story really isn't the rain. Uh, we're going to be looking at more wind into the forecast. We're going to subtract some showers, but we're going to add in some wind tomorrow. Temperatures will be hanging out into the 50s and 60s for the next couple of days. But nicer conditions abound for the weekend with highs well into the 70s, Saturday and Sunday. Well, I'm just looking ahead to that. You'll yeah. enjoy that. Okay, come back and see us tomorrow. We'll be here. Hope to have you as well.